Greetings once more, dear viewer, and welcome back. In the last part, we took a tour of some of the key properties of light, what they tell us about the universe, and what that means for the likelihood of geocentrism having merit. In short, we found it has none, and no one was surprised. We also looked at Doppler shift and its application to the stars in finding one component of their velocities through space. We also saw how it provides another means of confirming Earth's annual orbit around the solar system's barycenter. Doppler shift also occurs for the motion of the entire solar system through space. This effect is observable in the cosmic microwave background, the first high-precision measurements of which were made by the COBE satellite launched in 1989. Predictions and initial measurements of the temperature of interstellar space had been ongoing for decades, but it was Arno Penzias and Robert Wilson of Bell Labs who accidentally discovered the CMB whilst searching for the source of noise in their experimental antenna, and in doing so confirmed those predictions. They were awarded the 1978 Nobel Prize for Physics. The CMB is highly isotropic, but not perfectly so. One source of an isotropy, the one you're most likely familiar with, is seen in the increasingly precise maps returned by COBE, WMAP, and now Planck. These tiny fluctuations in the temperature of the CMB are due to fluctuations in the density of the universe at the time it became transparent to photons. To produce these maps, though, another source of an isotropy must be accounted for and subtracted from the data. The dipole. The measured radiation appears slightly warmer in the direction of the constellation of Leo and cooler in the opposite direction of the constellation of Aquarius. The temperature difference corresponds to a speed of 371 km per second. This is the speed of our solar system relative to the background radiation of the universe. One might expect this motion to be that of the solar system around the galaxy, and whilst that is one component of the overall velocity seen in the CMB, it is not the sole cause. The velocity measured in the CMB is in the opposite direction, and too high. This tells us not just that we're moving, but that the entire galaxy is moving. But that's not all. The four years of data returned by COBE also confirmed another aspect of our motion through space. There is a slight change in the direction and amplitude of the dipole anisotropy, and it occurs in a yearly cycle. In essence, the annual effects on light that we saw in the last part, such as the variation in Doppler shift that Vogel and Shiner observed for stars, also occurs for the CMB, and this is exactly what we'd expect to see. The CMB is, after all, just another form of light, and subject to the same phenomena. How would the fixed Earth clung to by geocentrists account for these observations? Without a moving observer, the radiation coming from all directions has no red or blue shift due to that motion. So there are a couple of possible explanations. The first is that the entire surface of last scattering was moving in a single direction to create a consistent illusion of a dipole anisotropy in the radiation observed by static Earthlings billions of years later. The second is that for some reason at the surface of last scattering, the light emitted on one half of the universe was slightly warmer than the other, with a perfect gradation in between the two halves that again created a dipole, entirely consistent with the observer having a velocity. Of course, neither of these account for the annual sinusoidal wobble seen in the dipole, and nor can they. Sadly then, geocentrists are a bit stuffed, and left looking for another cack-handed explanation that won't explain the rest of their fantasy universe. Of course, they could just start with something simpler. William Herschel was the first to discover that the Sun is moving through space, a feat he accomplished in 1783 by measuring and studying the proper motion of stars. He also established the direction of motion towards the star Vega and the constellation Hercules. Again, we find geocentrists are way behind the curve. Observations of the earliest light to traverse the universe after recombination tell us once again that Earth is moving, that the Sun is moving, and that the galaxy is moving. There's also a certain poetry to be found in the earliest observable photons of the universe preempting the lunacy of geocentrism by showing it's a load of bollocks. In a universe where everything rotates around at least one axis, and where planets orbit stars unless they have been ejected from their host system, Geocentrists think they live on a special planet made by a sky fairy just for them, with the entire universe rotating round them because they're so very important. 
Unfortunately, their Sky Fairy seems to like to form other planetary systems too, and for those the Fairy has the planets and other material going around the stars, rather than the arse backward plan that some think he used for Earth. The IRAS Infrared Telescope was launched in 1983 on a nine month mission to map almost the entire sky in infrared from wavelengths of 12 to 100 micrometers. It discovered an excess of infrared light from Vega, Fomalhaut, Epsilon Eridani and Beta Pictoris. Subsequent optical observation of these stars found scattered light from dust around them, showing disc-shaped structures. The first was observed around Beta Pictoris in 1984 by Smith and Turiel. Fomalhaut, Epsilon Eridani and Beta Pictoris have all been found to have candidate planets in orbit around them. The debris disk around Fomalhaut contains the first directly imaged extrasolar object orbiting another star. Fomalhaut B could be a planet, or it could just be a very large gravitationally bound conglomeration of debris. Whatever it is, independent teams have confirmed its existence as an object orbiting that star with a period of about 2,000 years. A planet orbiting Beta Pictoris was also confirmed in 2009. It has a much shorter orbital period of 15 to 20 years, the shortest of any directly observed exoplanet so far. It will be possible within a human lifespan to observe several orbits. It has already been observed on opposite sides of its host star. Planets and debris disks form from protoplanetary disks, or proplids. This is Orion, a familiar constellation to most. With the naked eye, the middle light source of Orion's sword is little more than a fuzzy star. Gather light with a long enough exposure and something more spectacular appears. About the same apparent diameter as the full moon, this is the Orion Nebula, 1500 light years away. There are about 3000 stars in this image, and the Orion Nebula is an active star forming region. Around many of the new stars are also proplids. The easiest ones to see are those in silhouette against the glowing background of the nebula. There are over 150 proplids in the Orion Nebula at various stages of formation. If the universe really were magicked into existence 6,000 years ago, it seems that our Sky Ferry has long since got bored and has other celestial construction projects underway. What would remain a mystery is why, having created an entire universe billions of light years across in just six days to put a 13,000 km wide ball of rock at the centre of it, the Sky Ferry is taking so damn long to build the systems in the Orion Nebula. Thankfully, it's not a mystery, because the same physics that operate on and around Earth also account for the formation of proplids. Since we observe material orbiting stars elsewhere in the universe, what are the chances that our star circles the Earth? Zero, primarily because geocentrism is bollocks. Not all of the proplids in the Orion Nebula will go on to form planetary systems, but that's okay, as at the 17th of December 2013, 1,055 planets have been discovered in 801 planetary systems. 16 of those may be habitable. The Kepler Space Telescope has found 3,538 candidate planets awaiting confirmation, including over 200 that may be habitable. In Part 7 we looked at how Doppler Shift contributes to our ability to work out the motions of stars. It also provides a means of detecting that a star has one or more planets orbiting it. Light, as we know, is good, even mythical sky fairies say so. As a star and its planet orbit their barycenter, the star's Doppler shift varies about its mean value. Monitor that over a long enough period of time and the variations become apparent. What drives this behaviour? We would love it to be Mr Space Hammerman swinging the stars around, but sadly it isn't. So we're left with one contender. Gravity, you f***ing retard! The first exoplanet discovered using Doppler spectroscopy was 51 Pegasi b by Michel Mayer and Didier Calo using the Elodi spectrograph at the Haute Provence Observatory in southern France. Elodi is capable of measuring velocity shifts of 7 meters per second. If you think that's accurate, the appropriately named High Accuracy Radial Velocity Planet Searcher spectrographs, installed at La Silla Observatory in Chile in 2002, and at TNG in La Palma in 2012, can measure velocities with a precision of just 0.3 meters per second. That's just 0.671 miles per hour. It's accurate enough that seismic activity on the star can be a limiting factor, rather than the accuracy of the instrument. 
such as their precision and, of course, the inherent nature of light. The Doppler method allows the minimum mass and orbital period of a planet to be determined. The motion of a star isn't straightforward when there is more than one planet in its system, just as the Sun's orbit around the solar system's barycenter isn't straightforward. In these cases, complex statistical analysis can, with good data, reveal details of additional planets orbiting the star. The transit method measures the brightness of a star and looks for dips in its brightness as the planet transits in front of it, blocking some of its light. Clearly, this method can only be used when the orbital plane is aligned with our line of sight to a star. The proportion of stars where this is the case is small, so you can't use this method on them all. However, there are billions of stars in our galaxy, so small probabilities can still yield results if you monitor enough stars. Candidate planets found this way can then be confirmed by other methods such as the Doppler method, and 428 have been found so far using the transit method. There are a range of other methods for detecting planets and determining their characteristics, all of which are testament to the precise measurements that can now be undertaken, and the ingenuity of figuring out those methods. Exoplanets can now be directly imaged. Measuring the amount of infrared radiation from a planet before it is eclipsed by its host star allows its surface temperature to be determined, and even temperature maps can be produced. Spectrographic changes during a transit allow their atmospheric composition to be determined. In the case of HD 189733b, the colour of the planet has also been inferred via polarimetry to be a deep blue. Just as exoplanets form from protoplanetary disks, our solar system did too. This idea was first suggested in the 1700s. French scientist Pierre Simon Laplace and German philosopher Immanuel Kant considered that the arrangement of the orbits of the planets couldn't be coincidence. They all orbit in the same direction and in nearly the same plane. However, rather than sit back and lazily blame a magic man in the sky, Laplace and Kant independently proposed that the solar system formed from a vast rotating cloud of dust and gas. We now know that space is full of such clouds. The formation of rotating disc-shaped structures from the gravitational collapse of molecular clouds is an inevitable consequence of physics. Collisions between particles orbiting the centre of gravity shape the disc as well as heating its central region, which is further heated through Kelvin-Helmholtz contraction. A protostar forms in the centre of the disc where the temperatures and pressures are highest. The change in temperatures and pressures across the disc as a whole governs the condensation temperature of every substance at a given distance within the disc. Substances with low condensation temperatures, such as water, methane and ammonia, could only remain liquid or solid in the outer regions of the solar nebula. Materials with high condensation temperatures, such as metals and their oxides, could survive as solids in the higher temperatures of the inner regions of the disk. It comes as no surprise, then, that the inner planets are rocky and high in metals, whilst those in the outer solar system are high in gases and ices. There is still dust left over from the formation of the solar system, too. If you live in an area with very dark skies, you can see this dust strewn along the line of the ecliptic, reflecting sunlight after sunset or before sunrise. This is the zodiacal light. If you are really lucky and many miles from any inhabited part of Earth, you'll also see the Gagan shine at a point in the night sky opposite the sun. First described in 1730, it was investigated and correctly explained by Theodore Brawson in 1854. And if you're really, really lucky, you might see that the zodiacal light encompasses the entire ecliptic. Where could this dust have come from? Not to mention a bunch of planets orbiting a star. It's all consistent with what we observe elsewhere in the universe. The discovery of proplids, debris disks, and an ever-growing list of exoplanets tells us that our solar system is not the only home to planets in the universe. Our galaxy alone is statistically likely to have billions. Geocentrists, then, are left in an even more improbable position than they were before exoplanets were discovered. Since physics has no place in geocentrism, its proponents are left needing to invoke the magic powers of an invisible sky fairy who poofed things into existence and maintains the apparent order of the universe using forces they can't name or describe. In their fantasy universe, the Sky Fairy who made it apparently likes putting dust and gas in orbit around other stars, likes making and putting other planets around other stars, and even likes putting our solar system's planets in orbit around their host star, 
but decided just once to make a special case to sate the small-minded delusions of self-importance that infected some of its inhabitants. He then forgot to tidy up and left some more dust lying around the solar system, figuring it made the sky look real pretty like. And it made a nice backdrop to his meteor shower shenanigans. If the need to invoke magic sky fairies sounds a bit far-fetched, you'll find yourself drifting as if bound by gravity or reason to more realistic, tested and grown-up explanations, and from there to the inevitable conclusion that geocentrism is bollocks. Having established that our invisible sky fairy appears to be lacking a cosmic vacuum cleaner, in part 9 we'll be looking to see what else he's left lying around, why Mr. Space Hammer Man may have other duties, and what that tells us about the sky fairy conjecture. Creationists might like to note in advance that, in the only sense of the word that they know of, the sky fairy conjecture really is still only a theory. See you then.